The criminal justice system, a series of laws and policies meant to protect us from harm. Unfortunately for us, there are exceptions. Good intentions capable of victimizing the innocent and causing more harm than good. Join the Honey Badgers as we discuss the top 10 craziest rape policies. As always, the show will be available for download after the broadcast at HoneyBadgerBrigade.com. Hello and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. Tonight's topic is the top 10 craziest rape policies. Number 10, uh, the yes means yes standard for consent on college campuses. Last year, California adopted the yes means yes standard for consent on college campuses. This switched the standard from regular consent to affirmative consent, where partners have to constantly check in during intercourse. Otherwise, it could be viewed as sexual assault in the eyes of the campus. Consent must be enthusiastic or it somehow doesn't count. The Dear Colleague Letter. The Dear Colleague le Letter was a document suggesting that colleges lower the standard of evidence needed to find someone guilty of sexual assault. As a result of the, st the standards fell from the beyond a, shadow, sorry, beyond a reasonable doubt standard to a preponderance of evidence standard, meaning that the likelihood that it, an assault took place must only be greater than 50% for the alleged assailant to be considered guilty. The UK now requires accused men to prove that women consented as their national guide, their, sorry, their nationwide guideline for consent. That's how they, they go about prosecuting uh, somebody. Basically, if you've been accused of rape in the UK now, uh, because I think this had to do, this was more of a recent reform, uh, they said they wanted to bring rape policies into uh in, okay, into uh you know the the new millennium i guess i, I don't remember how the recording is but yeah they, they said that it was old and outdated like how so far there has been no federal investigation to the epidemic of sexual abuse of juvenile boys in detention facilities by adult female captors Approximately 10,000 boys are sexually abused every year in juvenile detention facilities, the majority of them by women. To put this in perspective, since the 1960s, 12,000 mostly boys have come forward about the Catholic Church sex scandals. That's 12,000 over 50 years. Yet almost as many boys are abused by female guards in a single year just in the United States. Feminist groups or women's groups blocking a rape law to protect male, uh, men and boy victims of female abusers in Israel and also in India. A women's group in Israel cancels a law that would protect men and boys against female rapists. In India, women's groups oppose changing a law against sexual abuse from using the word rape to sexual assault. They did so because of the term sexual assault would have included the possibility of women as perpetrators of rape. They used the same argument that women's group in, groups in Israel did. So both the women's group in in India and the women's group in Israel used exactly the same argument why men and boys should not have protection against female rapists. And that argument was that men and boys would falsely accuse women of rape. Non-government organizations, aid, essentially aid organizations, making it informal policy to discriminate, discriminate against male victims of sexual violence. Apparently aid agencies that help survivors of sexual assault in war-torn or poverty-stricken regions openly discriminate against male victims. They restrict the definition of rape to female victims, leading to complete invisibility of male victims and statistics. They even turn horribly abused male victims away at the door and restrict funding programs if the majority of services are not granted to women. Okay, so ignoring the high rate of civilian female sexual abuse, uh, for civilian and female sexual service woman, sexual abuse of male servicemen. Uh, as a listener, you've probably heard a lot about the high rate of sexual abuse in the army. Once again, it's mostly portrayed as male servicemen assaulting a female or sometimes a male. Did you know that at least half of servicemen victimized sexually in the military are victimized either by a female serviceman or servicewoman or a female civilian? That's what the statistics actually show. At least half of guys in the military are being victimized by women. All right, here's the doozy. Mary Koss, feminist Mary Koss, influencing the Center of Disease Control to redefine a female rapist physically forcing a man to have sex as made to penetrate. 
Feminist Mary Koss doesn't think a man pointing at a gun, a gun at a, uh, doesn't think a woman putting a gun at a man, stripping him and forcing envelopment on him to be rape. In other words, forcing his penis into her vagina to be rape. Feminist Mary Koss was a, consult, a consultant to the Center of Disease Control. As a consultant to the Center of Disease Control, she likely influenced them to change their policies regarding what they consider rape in government statistics, in the government statistics they gather on rape. In an interview with the Center of Disease Control, Hannah Wallen requested their rationale for using the made to penetrate definition for victims, fem victims of female aggressors. Apparently, in the interview with Hannah Wallen, the representative for the Center of Disease Control lied about what definition the Center of Disease Control uses for rape. As you can see, when you go to their website, the CDC defines rape thusly. Quote, a completed sex act, i.e. rape, is defined as contact between the penis and vulva or the penis and anus involving penetration, however slight, contact between the mouth and penis, vulva and anus, or penetration of the anal or genital opening of another person by a hand, finger, or other object. And in other words, this definition includes a woman making contact between her vulva or vagina and a, pe and a man and a vi male victim's penis. So on their website, they actually use a gender inclusive definition on ra of rape. Yet in its intimate partner in sexual violence surveys, the CDC splits rape into two categories: rape when it's a male aggressor penetrating a, vi a victim, and made to penetrate when it's a female aggressor enveloping a victim. As a strange coincidence, this is co this is consistent with Mary Koss's theorizing about the experiences of men having been physically forced into having sex by a female aggressor. Then, rather than being raped, it was uh, it just wasn't rape because reasons. Incidentally, if you use the CDC's own definition of rape rather than the categories invented, they invented just for their survey, just for their government statistics, the CDC is finding that men consistently report rape, the, the same or more rape victimization as women in the last year. So in 2010, men reported the same amount of rape victimization. In 2000, I believe 12 or 11, men reported the same rate of rape victimization, or greater rate of rape victimization as women. Okay, so item number two, just international uh, Just Detention International, which for those of you who don't know, is supposedly an aid organization that's trying to end prison rape, using elaborate mental gymnastics to turn prison rape from something that primarily victimizes men into something that really victimizes women. Oh, So-called prison rape reform activist Luisiva Stanow of Just Detention International describes male prison rape as being about misogyny because men will sexually dominate each other when they don't have women to sexually dominate. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> This despite the fact that male prisoners are actually more likely to be sexually abused and exploited by female guards than other male inmates. And also for the misogyny uh, double play award, Miss Stanow, um, she also is, is rendering invisible the fact that female inmates are more likely to be sexually abused by other female inmates. Okay, so this is number one, feminist groups and then this is an unwritten policy. And also, I suppose, traditionalist groups, too. This is sort of like a, almost like a universal thing. Uh, targeting men as perpetrators rather than victims of, ra of rape in their rape awareness campaigns. Because, you know, we, we need more awareness that men are rapists or that men rape. And we don't need awareness that women rape. But anyway. If you took your information about sexual abuse solely from feminist literature on the issue, you'd probably conclude that the majority of perpetrators are men and the majority of victims are women. Feminist Mary Koss has influenced the Center of Disease Control to erase male rape victims from government statistics. Feminists and so-called anti-rape lobby groups like Just Detention International, apparently in complete denial of the reality of prison rape, reduce situations of overwhelming vic male victimization to female victimization via convoluted theories about toxic masculinity. And women's, and, uh, as an icing on the cake, women's groups in Israel and Indri India have concretely removed or blocked men and boys' protections against 
rape. And finally, feminist rape campaigns usually present a very singular view of rape as something men do to women. This is a lot of institutional shit that's going on to make sure that we think of women as victims and men as perpetrators. But yet, when we look at the statistics, a completely different picture emerges. 38% of the victims of rape were men in the 2012 National Crime Victimization Survey. And this study, as I said before, requires men to classify their victimization as rape and as a crime. Both requirements lead to a reduction of admitted male rape victims relative to other survey instruments because men have difficulty admitting that they were raped or admitting that what happened to them was criminal in any way, and they even more have a difficulty admitting that face-to-face with a surveyor. 43% of college men and high school youth report being sexually assaulted or raped, 95% by women. In another similar survey, 51% of college men report being sexually assaulted or raped since the age of 16, again, 95% by women. According to the CDC's 12-month statistics, two years in a row, 50% of the victims of forced sex were male. And, of course, they will not release the uh, st- breakdown of the male and female statistics of perpetration on that statistic, but according to their lifetime statistics, 80% of the men were raped by women. So the number one craziest policy regarding rape is the fact that our society, and it's an informal unwritten policy, is the fact that our society continues to grant feminists and predatory aid agencies and traditionalists who still believe in that particular model that men rape and women are victims of authority over the word rape. And they continue to reduce a complex problem down to a black and white, woman equal victim, man equal predator, damseling for dollars, narrative scheme that's great for milking the public for moolah, but terrible at actually helping any victims at all. And when we say victims, I mean not just victims of rapists, but also victims of those rapey policies by rapey organizations who create a climate of fear for women by exaggerating their victimization, by presenting rape as something that men do to them because they're women, and demonizing men, which I would consider is basically a social rape on uh, on a wide scale. And that is the final craziest thing, craziest unwritten policy about rape. Uh, Okay. All right. So what I want to say is this. There was also funding cut to female specific uh, health issues as well. right? But so once again, we see men and women both being screwed in order to pump money into this damseling for dollars scheme that helps nobody, least of which female or male victims of rape. There there were a lot of cuts. The thing about it is, is that these are things that are supposed here's the thing they didn't cut all the funding to breast cancer re- and, and cervical cancer research and, and uh, education and stuff like that this proposed cut from what i understand and this is only according to the advocacy groups the, the stuff like the few sources that were actually been covering this um this is all of the money that was into the CDC's budget for prostate cancer research and education and stuff like that. So I guess the Affordable Care Act will take care of uh, research for prostate cancer then as well. Like it's taking care of the screenings of, of female well, services. This, this is just from the CDC, but it's still kind of distressing that this is like, you know what? Oh, fuck prostate cancer. We think that adequate screening should should help this instead of, you know, we may try and find ways to actually completely prevent it. Fix it. <laughs> yeah. that, that would, you know, that would be nice. They're like, no, no, listen, we, we feel that the money we've put into the Affordable Care Act is going to be enough uh, to, to help people in, in, in screenings. Well, see, screenings only help people who already have the cancer. Well, you know, I, I, that, that only lets you know, oh, guess what, you've got cancer. What, what really gets me is that they're, they're diverting funds from cancer research to rape farming. Well, here's the thing, okay, the, the amount that went toward, that actually went into, it's going into rape prevention is, um, an, I think, an increase of $5 million. So not nearly the amount that prostate cancer had. Actually, I think the, the lion's share of it is going into... Um, ha- trying to combat uh, problems with um, 
so I think it more I think it's like more um, resistant resistant bacteria and stuff like that that's coming out of people using a lot of antibiotics and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, well, you know, honestly, honestly, it's going to be up to the Canadians to deal with the prostate cancer thing because, um, you know, like about four years ago, four and a half years ago, I was dating an oncologist and he was sitting on the board uh, that the he was sitting on the committee that, that issued grants and he was, you know, he was one of the people who decided what, you know, where the two and a half million dollars went um, to you know, to deal with prostate cancer and try and research a, a cure or a treatment, right? So, um, you know, that that sort of, we, we are a little bit more, I, I, maybe it's because we're not quite so concerned with turning a profit. Um, and uh, and one of the problems with prostate cancer is it's uh, it's generally a later in life disease, mm. you know. Whereas breast cancer often hits women in their thirties, right? Um, so so we don't we, we we sort of look at that that sixty year old guy who has prostate cancer and we're like ah you know well he's sixty, right? And, uh, and we don't really care as much. I mean, like there's, there's the male factor, there's the age factor as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it, it just, there, there has been some promising research regarding prostate cancer, cancer with retroviral, uh, genetic, uh, therapy, right. Mm -hmm. Um, gene therapy. So, I mean, you know, like, I, I don't understand why they would defund it. Yeah, it's it's completely ridiculous. Yeah, it, it really is. And they're like, oh, hey, you know what? We should pour like some money into like into research for yeah, you know, rape prevention because right. you've been so good at that. Yeah, that is not rape okay. <laughs> so I need to stop calling what they do rape prevention because it doesn't prevent anything. It actually ensures that it continues. I mean, it, for all we know, if we had gotten rid of all of the feminists and that, that particular narrative, the more traditionalist narrative about rape out of our culture, we would have ended it by now. If we I mean, look, not spent any money at, on it. Look at it this way. Look at it this way. Look at, look at the way the FBI redefined rape, right? And mm -hmm. it, was, it was very ambiguous as to whether that included male victims of major pen penetrate or not. Uh, the FBI actually did respond finally to somebody who sent repeated emails, right, asking whether a man forced into vaginal sex with a woman would be considered a rape victim under that definition, and the FBI said yes, right, but it was not clear in the definition. Um, it was ambiguous, right? And that means that law enforcement agencies may not automatically know to to file those things or to report those things as rapes because it, the definition that the FBI came up with is is ambiguous. Uh, I have uh, quite a few, um, you know, tens of thousands uh, of online clients uh, over the years. And uh, the way I run my room is I am completely welcoming to taboo role play to pretty much, I, I get off on what they get off on. It's weird, but that's just, it's what it is. Even if it's something I don't particularly like, if they're getting off on it, I, I'll like it more. So in that very open, welcoming environment, uh, people have, I can count on half of one hand on how many men had at all a dominating rape uh, kind of fantasy and wanted to role play that. It, it is, a, to me, at least from what I've seen, men want to be desired. They want the woman to have sex. And so this is really cuts to the core of the fact that we are running this narrative that women do not enjoy sex. The women do not enjoy sex, period, as Dworkin was saying that uh, the third wave feminism, which is why I have problem with it when it comes to sex positivity, because third wave feminism entirely dealt with Dworkin's if it is a sexual act that means a woman's being oppressed. So the very act of something that women enjoy, something that's necessary for reproduction, something what we've been doing since the beginning of time, that's how we got here, that's something somehow is offensive to women, and I believe that's total bull. On top of that, I know people, I am myself one, there are women who legitimately get off on consensual rape. There is an idea of, you know, like I said, romantic uh, Beauty and the Beast type, where, uh, you know, somebody's so into you, they just gotta have you, and it is basically consensual rape. You can consent to 
the fact that this man will impose himself on you and dominate you. And as Fifty Shades of Grey is any evidence at all, we as women are very much into the idea of a dominating man sexually. And uh, feminism is doing such a disservice to women uh, everywhere uh, by denying them their sexuality, by denying them their kings, by denying uh, them pleasure. And it's freaking disgusting, if, if I'm frank about it. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to pull one thing out because it, it ties right into the next news item. And this idea that, that feminism and this, it, it is, you know, there I, there's... The feminist narrative essentially is the, the traditionalist narrative, and I don't mean to pull out any particular culture when I say traditionalist, but because you, you see it with yin and yang, you see it all over the world, and there's a, there's a biological component to it, of course, that women receive men's actions, but the progressive slant is that is that women only receive it when women become victims of them. So it's like exactly the same thing, except just, just the most black and ugly way of looking at it possible. And, and it creates a culture of fear in which women limit themselves. They, they judge their own desires. They limit their interactions with men. They are unnecessarily afraid of men. And they limit their own potential. And for no good goddamn fucking reason. And cue the next news item, Rachel. <laughs> oh, God. Paranoid Stockholm woman causes man to speak on violence against women. Meanwhile, in Sweden, nursing student Johan Nylander, I'm probably butchering that name, decided to take a shortcut through the woods at night. A woman took one look at him and bolted. Instead of shrugging it off, Johan decided to talk about how sad it is that women live in fear of rape. Never mind that women are not the only people who experience that kind of violence. Nope, it's somehow men who are responsible somehow for women's feelings. Men must help women to be less paranoid about sexual assaults. According to the article discussing this post, it mentions that men in Sweden are twice as likely to be assaulted. But there doesn't seem to be, there doesn't appear to be campaigns to end violence of this kind against men. The perception there, like here in the West, is that there is a plague of violence against women, a rape epidemic that must be stopped. But in reality, is often the media hyping specific cases that gives people this impression. If you want people, if you want women to be less paranoid, how about you stop hyping gang rapes and brutal assaults on women? Instead, there, there's this white knight mentality that rises up and makes things worse. If you can't feel safe in a country with record low levels of crime, is there any place that can make you truly feel safe? Truly feel safe. If you enjoyed the contents of this podcast, please consider supporting our show. You can become our patron at www.patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. This show is made possible by the contributions of listeners such as yourself. Thank you for your donation.